Hello there. Uh, you're now going to see me recording part two of uh, this double episode that I'm doing about Gordon Ramsay. Uh, this is Luke's English Podcast. My name's Luke. I'm an English teacher and I do uh, a podcast for learners of English. And uh, in this video, you're going to see me recording an episode of, of this uh of this podcast and this episode I think is going to be episode 432 and it's part it's the second part of a double ep of a double episode that I'm doing about uh, Gordon Ramsay and his TV show. Uh, I'm not going to give too much of an introduction now. I'll probably do that on the podcast itself when I press record on my audio device in just a moment. Uh, if you'd like to download the audio for this so that you can listen to it anytime you like, just go to the link in the description and there you can download uh, this episode and you can in fact download all the other episode of Luke's all the other episodes of Luke's English podcast that I've done and there are about 431 of those episodes now available to you free of course it's a podcast you can find it on iTunes you can find it on other podcasting services okay check it out right then so let's let's get started again with uh with this episode and uh, this is going to be part two of the Gordon Ramsay episode then so I need to start with the jingle and then we will be rolling okay then um all right so here we go here comes the jingle press record <laughs> You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. How are you doing out there? Uh, now, some of you may have just finished listening to episode 431. So let's carry on. This is episode 432 then. And this is the second part of a double episode that I'm doing here about Gordon Ramsay and his TV show, Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares. Okay, so um, in the last episode, uh, I basically told you about Gordon Ramsay and just sort of told you all the things that I thought you needed to know about this guy and about his TV show. We talked about restaurant culture in the UK and the influence of sort of um, manufacturing companies on, uh, on, on restaurants uh, and the way that restaurants are run in the UK these days and the sort of the difference between um, restaurants that um, cook local food fresh food and restaurants that choose to buy food from manufacturing companies and the sort of economic concerns of people who run restaurants and how it's difficult to provide the best kind of food you can when the market is being sort of dominated by uh, manufacturing companies that sell processed foods to, uh, to, to restaurants at a, at a cheaper price. It must be very difficult to run a restaurant effectively these days in the UK in the midst of economic crisis and, and all these other things. Um, it must be very difficult. But anyway, so we're continuing the, the topic of restaurants and food and working in, in restaurants and, and uh, eating in restaurants and things with this episode. Um, and um, so what you can expect with this one as we continue is uh, we're going to listen to a few more extracts from an episode of Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares, the television programme in which Gordon Ramsay, this uh, excellent chef, goes into restaurants that are struggling and tries to help them uh, solve their problems. And there's a lot of drama in the process. Uh, so we'll be listening to some of that. And the idea is that we are looking for English, all right? We're looking for natural English, the kind of English that people really, really do speak in the real world. Uh, also, watch out for some language. You know, we'll be talking about, you know, food preparation, about the business of running a restaurant, um, and um, you'll also be hearing from uh, Gordon Ramsay himself, this foul-mouthed chef who swears so much. And so, yeah, this is about learning real English. Um, you know, uh, the real English direct from people's mouths. This is um, not just some language picked by someone not just some language picked by a, a, you know, a teacher or the language you get from a textbook, but in this case, we're actually learning, uh, you know, just how people really talk. Um, and uh, that includes swear words. So this episode will contain some swearing, some rude language. Um, and um, so, you know, you can learn how people really do swear in English. Not that you should. I'm not saying you should swear. In fact, to be honest, I'm saying that you shouldn't really, but it might be useful to learn how people actually do it. And actually, when you investigate swearing from a linguistic point of view, you notice that swear words are actually quite 
quite adaptable and quite flexible in terms of the way that they can be used in sentences. And, you know, if you're not too bothered by swearing, if it's not that offensive for you, if you can look at it just from a, a language point of view, it can be interesting to look at some of the, frankly, quite inventive uh, phrases that you get that involve swearing. So, you know, obviously swearing is used to express surprise or shock or express disgust or just to emphasize certain parts of a sentence. Um, and, um, you know, for some people it's it's used a lot. Like, for example, Gordon Ramsay. He's well known for being foul-mouthed. And, um, you know, that's quite controversial. A lot of people really don't like it. Um, you know, I understand that. But anyway, what we're trying to do here on Luke's English Podcast is try to understand the language, all of it, you know, without without sort of turning a blind eye to any aspect of the language. We, we, uh, you know, I, I think it's important to look at all of it and try and understand it and understand how people really use it. OK, so let's carry on. Now, in the first part of this episode, as I said, I talked about restaurants, I talked about Gordon Ramsay. Then we listened to a clip from an episode of his show. And in that one, if you remember, what happened basically, the story so far is that uh, Gordon Ramsay went to this place called uh, Dovecote Bistro in Devon, in the southwest of England. And he, he checked out the menu. The menu looked quite good, but then when he came to try some of the food, he was very disappointed. In fact, very, in fact, shocked at the uh, standard of, um, of the food. And he was served um, uh, some duck uh, cooked with an orange sauce and the you know normally an orange sauce like that would be used uh, would be cooked using genuine orange so orange juice like proper orange juice freshly squeezed juice but this one was made using orange squash which is a sort of you know um, not fresh it's concentrated which means you have to add water to, to be able to, to actually drink it it's full of it's probably full of chemicals and preservatives and coloring enhancers and things like that not the kind of thing that you'd really really want in a good quality restaurant then uh, Gordon tried the lamb and it turned out the lamb uh, he, it was inedible he couldn't he refused to eat it and the waitress told him that the lamb in fact had been not cooked fresh there on the premises but actually had been bought uh, from you know a manufacturing company. And that company had pre-cooked, they, they'd cooked the lamb there in the factory or whatever. And then the lamb had been sealed, vacuum packed inside a plastic bag. You know, all the air had, take, had been taken out to seal the lamb inside a plastic bag. And then uh, Mick, the owner of the restaurant, had kept uh, this in a box on the floor of the restaurant for God knows how long, months probably, because these va vacuum-packed lamb shanks uh, can be stored for up to 12 months because of the chemicals, mainly. The chemicals used inside the the the, the, the preparation of the, the lamb and the fact that the, the, the pieces of lamb are vacuum-packed. Now, this is not proper sort of wholesome uh, cooking, is it? No, this is like cooking eight with loads of chemicals and loads of processing which um you know obviously is, i understand why restaurants do that because it's cheaper basically to buy processed foods it's cheaper and it's more practical to use but uh for someone like gordon ramsay who is all about quality um and quality in food drives everything that you know he thinks should be done in a restaurant um you know this is a bloody nightmare really for 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 that kind of spirit so okay then so let's carry on and um so as we left it, uh, we learnt that Mick, uh, the, the guy who ran the kitchen, was really stubborn. Like he was refused to, to change or refused to accept that there was a problem. And um, so what happens next then is uh, as Gordon tries to get to the root of the problem in this restaurant, he learns that it's kind of about the dynamic between the members of the family. And it gets pretty personal and it gets a little bit... Um, um, What's the word for it? It gets a little dramatic as the uh, the family start to argue. It creates a rift in the family, a rift, a split in the family with the with Mick on one side and Mick's wife and adopted daughter on the other side. So there's this rift in the family. So we're going to carry on and listen and, and listen to a couple of other scenes from this episode. Um, and um, th this it it gets pretty uh, intense in some parts. And what you're going to hear is some. Uh, arguments. You'll hear some family arguments. So you'll hear people 
arguing with each other, getting upset. There are tears, there's anger, there's like quite strong emotions. So you're about to listen to some, you know, English used in in, an, a, fam, in a family argument and there will be more swearing. All right, let's continue then. So let me just bring down that music there. So then uh, let's go to video two then. The, this, is, this is on YouTube. You'll find these videos also embedded on the page for this episode on my website. All right, then, so let's listen to a bit more and let's see if you can follow what's going on. So here in this clip, uh, we're in the kitchen of the restaurant and Gordon Ramsay is still trying to argue the point to Mick that this kind of uh, pre-prepared food is not acceptable. He's trying to get that through to Mick, but Mick's not really willing to accept it. He still seems to think that it's okay. And it's not really if you're trying to run a proper restaurant. Okay. Should we talk about the duck? Yeah, go on. What the fuck did you put in that sauce? So, by the way, I'm just going to let you listen to this. It's about a minute and 20 minutes long. So I'll let you listen to the whole thing, then we'll break it down so that you understand it all bit by bit, okay? Should we talk about the duck? Yeah, go on. What the fuck did you put in that sauce? It's like some fucking sci-fi sperm. Sci-fi sperm? Yeah, where's the, where's the orange juice? So it's an orange squash? Yes. Yeah, a, a concentrate? Yeah. You know, all the reports of the people who do eat love the sauce, you know. I've got to be so honest there. Uh, and do. the lamb shank. Yeah. I've never okay. had one complaint. As a restaurateur, whatever you want to call yourself, your responsibility is providing them with at least something fresh. And especially at fucking 11 quid. It's about right, though, isn't it? About right. Four times it. Help. Well, he's a stubborn fucker, this I one. I know he is a stubborn fucker. Right. I'll be the first one to admit that. But we desperately, desperately need help from yourself. And I'm sorry, I'm going to get emotional. I don't want you to get upset. I no, am, because I... my husband's been slated to death and we worked so hard for this business and it's just killing us all. Come on. Wait, I want to and, and I'm not right. denying that you guys work fucking hard. I can see that in your face. Yeah. I can see that from your daughter. Well, I just don't know what I'm saying. I'm going to get some fresh air. Fuck me. Ooh, okay. It's all getting a bit dramatic in the kitchen there. Uh, did you follow that? Did you follow what the problems were? Um, and uh, let's go through that again then and break it down. And I'm just writing some notes here on some of the language that uh, uh, I noticed. And I'll, I'll be putting this on the page for the episode so you can check all this stuff out. But let's go through it now then and let's see if we can pick up some vocab and just notice a few things about the language. All right. Should we talk about the duck? Did you get that? Did you get that? Six words. Shall we talk about the duck? Should we talk about the duck? Can you repeat that? Should we talk about the duck? Should we talk about the duck? Shall we talk about the duck? Should we talk about the duck? Shall we? It's used to, to give a, a suggestion, isn't it? Shall we talk about the duck? Shall we? Shall we talk about the duck? Should we talk about the duck? Yeah, go on. Yeah, go on. What the fuck did you put in that sauce? What the fuck did you put in that sauce? What did you put in that sauce? What the fuck did you put in that sauce? What the hell did you put in that sauce? What the fuck did you put in that sauce? Put in that sauce? It's like some fucking sci-fi sperm. <laughs> That's a pretty weird uh, image. It's like some sort of sci-fi sperm. Okay, I'm going to have to explain that now, aren't I? Yes, I am. Okay, it's like some sort of sci-fi sperm. So the sauce, this is this this sauce that was, you know, served with a duck made from orange squash, this brightly coloured orange stuff, orange juice, basically, full of chemicals. And he's like, it was like some sort of sci-fi sci -fi sperm. Sci-fi, you know what that is? Science fiction, right? It was like something out of a science fiction movie. You know, like uh, imagine like the blood of an alien or something. It would be brightly orange. 
But the, in this case, Gordon's analogy is not that it was blood, it was sperm. Sci-fi sperm, it's a really disgusting image, but, you know, it, it's quite... Uh, it's quite a good image for describing how awful this orange uh, sauce was. What is sperm, Luke? Do I have to explain that? Sperm is... Uh, let's try and do it scientifically, okay? Sperm is um, is what... Uh, uh, so, okay. So, when, uh, <laughs> when a man loves a woman um, and they want to make babies... Right? Now, for the baby to, to exist... Yes, I'm doing this. All right? So, um, right. So, the the, the mum has an egg, right? And for that egg to be fertilised, there needs to be a sperm. So, one single sperm is what comes through and fertilises the egg, right? Now, men of many species, most species, I believe, have many millions of sperm. And, and when it's produced, when it's produced, you, you note the use of the passive there to avoid having to say who produces it or how or what produces it. When sperm is produced, it it comes out in the form of a kind of a liquid, doesn't it? Okay. So that can also be called sperm. So the stuff that is produced uh, when, um, uh, when grown married adults um, choose to have uh, have children. Uh, sperm is is i think you get the idea i think you just google it if you well no don't 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 google it actually don't google it. just look it up in an old fashioned dictionary not a picture dictionary just a normal one okay <clears throat> anyway uh, gordon ramsay said that the orange sauce looked like sci-fi sperm which is like some sort of disgusting uh, brightly colored orange sperm from another dimension but that's honestly how disgusting the stuff was apparently but it's quite a funny use of language. And in fact, even in the middle of that, Mick's wife, who's like all serious, standing there, you know, it's a really serious moment. She's like, sci-fi sperm? She almost finds it funny as well because it's such a bizarre image. Anyway, let's not get caught up on sci-fi sperm, shall we? Let's not spend too too long on that on YouTube or... Oh, by the way, this is on YouTube as well, this episode. Uh, all right, so anyway, let's carry on. Yeah, go on. What the fuck did you put in that sauce? It's like some fucking sci-fi sperm. Sci-fi sperm? Yeah, where's the, where's the orange juice? So it's an orange squash? Yes. Yeah, a, a concentrate? Yeah. You know, all the reports of the people we do eat love the sauce. So he's saying that all the reports of the people... All the reports of the people we're doing... I can't really understand what he's getting at, but I think he's saying that, you know, people say that they love the sauce. All the reports of the people we're doing... Do we love yeah, anyway? People love the sauce. He also says the sauce is orange squash. Okay, I've been through that. We know what that is. It's a kind of concentrated orange juice. Concentrate, concentrate. Now, um, so concentrate is a verb. We know that it means focus. Come on, concentrate on your work, for example. That's the verb concentrate, but concentrate's got other meanings too. And as a noun, as an uncountable noun, concentrate means usually like juice that's been reduced. It's like a concentrated form of juice, and uh, it's produced like that uh, because it lasts longer, I think. I'm not sure quite how it works, but anyway, you get orange juice, which is freshly squeezed, and then you get orange juice from concentrate. So concentrate means that the juice has been reduced down, so that I guess there's less water in it, and there's it's more... Um, well, it's more concentrated, right? So all you need to do with concentrate is you add water. So when you buy orange juice from concentrate, it means that um, that water has been added to it to turn it into the juice that you have now. So orange juice from concentrate lasts longer, but it doesn't taste as good as freshly squeezed orange juice. Okay. So if you ever see the word concentrate or from concentrate on the side of uh, a, a carton of orange juice, it means it's not freshly squeezed. Okay. All right. Yeah, you ever see that? You ever see the word concentrate written on the side of a, a carton of orange juice? That's what that means. Now, actually, here's a joke for you. I'm going to tell you a joke, all right? Now, don't get overexcited. You probably won't find it funny, but I will explain it to you. And then you definitely won't find it funny. But any, in any case, uh, I like jokes. Who doesn't? Here's a joke for you. Um, so why did, the, why did the supermodel... It's a bit... A bit prejudiced towards supermodels, but anyway. 
Why did the supermodel stare at the orange juice? Why did the supermodel stare at the orange juice? Because it said concentrate on the carton. It said concentrate on the carton, so so she concentrated on the car carton. Okay, never mind. Jokes. What are you gonna do? Jokes. All right, fine. So uh, anyway, what about the juice? It's from concentrate, and uh, Mick is like stubbornly unwilling to accept that there's anything wrong with this. Yes. I concentrate. Yeah. You know, all the reports of the people we do eat love the sauce. You know. I've got to be so honest there. And the too. lamb shank. Yeah. I've never and, you know, people love the sauce and the lamb shanks. And then Michelle, the daughter, says, yeah, I've never had one complaint about the lamb. Lamb shanks? Yeah. I've never okay. had one complaint. As a restaurateur, whatever you want to call yourself, your responsibility is providing them with at least something fresh. Your responsibility is providing them with at least something fresh. Okay, that's clear. And especially at fucking 11 quid. Especially at 11 quid. You know, 11 quid. Quid is pounds. That's like, you know, slang for pounds. We say quid. Five quid, 11 quid, you know, whatever. So quid. Uh, your responsibility is to provide them with something at least fresh, especially at 11 quid. I mean, come on, he's right, isn't he? He does, Mick does have a responsibility to provide them with half decent food, especially when you're charging 11 pounds for a dish. It's got to be, you know, proper food, right? And quid. Oh, right, isn't it? But Mick's response is, it's about right though, isn't it? It's about right though, isn't it? Now what's that? What does he say? It's about right though, isn't it? It's about right though, isn't it? Did you actually, do you know what he's actually saying there? Can you identify that? So your responsibility is to sell blah, 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 really proper fresh food, especially 11 quid. It's about right though, isn't it? It's about right though, isn't it? It's about, it's about right though, isn't it? It's about right though, isn't it? And what he means there is he thinks eleven pounds is about right as a price. He think it, he thinks it's a, an appropriate price. It's about right though, isn't it? Eleven pounds. And so Mick's completely unwilling to um, accept that that eleven pounds is too much for this kind of processed stuff. And Gordon Ramsay kind of shocked by that. And then he he says Mick is stubborn. And his wife uh, Mick's wife goes, "Yeah, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that." So I'm, you know, I'll be the first person to admit that he is stubborn. Remember stubborn? Stubborn means you're unwilling to change. Let's have a little look at the, um, let's have a look at the Collins Dictionary uh, definition for stubborn. Um, I've been using the Collins Dictionary online recently. I just find it to be really good. Um, let's have a look at how they define stubborn. Uh, Collins dictionary.com says that stubborn is an adjective. Someone who is stubborn or who behaves in a stubborn way Stubborn is spelled S-T-U-B-B-R-O-N. Okay. Um, someone who, believe, uh, who behaves in a stubborn way is determined to do what they want and is unwilling to change their mind. And it's often negative. Okay. For example, he's a stubborn character. He's used to getting his own way. His face was set in an expression of stubborn determination. Okay. Um, and stubbornly is an adverb. He stubbornly refused to tell her. Uh, okay, stubborn. So, you know, um, determined to do what they want. I'm going to do it my way and I'm not going to change and I'm not going to change my mind. That's stubborn. And she says, he's and, and Gordon Ramsay describes him as a stubborn fucker. So here's a bit of, here's an example of how swearing is, is used quite creatively. We've turned the word fuck into a noun for a person. What do you, you know, what's the noun for a, a person it's a fucker you stupid fucker you stupid fucker you ugly fucker for example and in this case it's he's a stubborn fucker isn't he it's about right though, isn't it about right four times it hell well he's a stubborn fucker this I one i know he is He's a stubborn fucker, this one. And she's like, I know he is. In fact, the wife, I can't remember her name, but she goes, help. She actually says help at one point. Uh, after Mick has gone, oh, it's about right though, isn't it? For four of them, about right. And she goes, help. As if to say, Gordon, please help us. This man is a nightmare. Help. Well, he's a stubborn fucker, this I one. I know he is a stubborn fucker. Right. I'll be the first one to admit that. But we desperately, desperately need help. 
We desperately, desperately need help. Wow, that's a quite a sincere uh, call for help, literally. Uh, we desperately, desperately need help. But it's quite a nice collocation, isn't it? Desperately need. Desperately need more time. We desperately need help. I desperately need the toilet, for example. Um, all right, so we desperately need, to, desperately, desperately need help. Desperately, desperately need help from yourself. From yourself, meaning from Gordon. And this is where she gets upset because she says, my husband's been slated to death. Slated. If someone's been slated, it means they've been strongly criticised. I don't know who's slated him. Maybe it's reviewers in in a, in a magazine or newspaper or something. Maybe it's Gordon Ramsay because he did just slate him there, didn't he? Saying all these things, uh, but it's probably lots of other people too who've slated uh, Mick for his you know cooking style or whatever. He's been slated to death, and she says, and it's killing us off as a family. It's killing us off means that you know what's happening is just killing the family. Killing the family off means completely killing them. It's sad. It's really sad that she's really desperate because this guy Mick is so stubborn. He's unwilling to change, even though his actions are causing them major problems, causing them to lose money because the restaurant's failing. She's desperately in need of his help, of Gordon's help, because her husband's been slated to death and it's killing us off. And she starts crying. It's quite sad. Help from yourself and I'm sorry I'm going to get emotional I don't want you to get upset I no, am because I... my husband's been slated to death and we worked so hard for this business and it's just killing us off we've worked so hard for this business and it's just killing us off and um, she says at the beginning of that she says I you know and I'm going to get emotional now if you get emotional it means that you you know for example you start crying or you start losing control of your emotions a bit I'm going to get emotional now. And then Gordon says, I don't want you to get upset. Because obviously his his purpose is that he wants to try and, you know, fix the problem. I don't want you to get upset. Now, upset is an interesting word. Because, and I think I got a message somewhere on email or somewhere recently from a listener who said, can you explain what upset means and how we use the word upset? So, okay, let's have a look at the word upset. Now, to be upset, so it's an adjective to be upset, and typically to get upset, which means to become upset. Be upset, uh, she's a bit upset, or she got upset, or she, you know, don't get upset. So if you are upset, it means that basically you're, you've become emotional. Now, if you're upset, it could mean that you are um, like sad, or it could mean that you're angry. But it means basically that your emotions are not sort of um, calm. So get upset. It's usually when you're like really emotional or you get really angry or you start crying. Um, and so that's upset. So it can be, you can be upset for different reasons and you can be upset in different ways. One of them would be just sad. Like, for example, if, you're, if your dog died, if your dog, you know, if your dog died, you'd be really upset. Oh, poor Fluffy. I can't believe we've had him since we were a kid. And just going to miss him so much. It's like, oh, don't be up. Don't. He's like, oh, God, she's really, he's really upset about the dog. I don't know what to do. Like, I just, I don't know if I can carry on because he just loved Fluffy so much. And it's like, it's like we'll, we'll get another dog. We'll just get another. You don't know. We can't get another dog. It's not, never get a minute. Right. It's like, don't get so upset. It's just a dog. It's not just a dog. He don't say that. You know, for example. Um, so, that's one example of getting upset. And the other one would be getting angry. Getting angry, like, for example, um, you know, like a guy says to his girlfriend, he's like, so, um, you know, I've invited all my friends over tonight. We're going to watch the football, okay. And she goes, but it's but it's our anniversary. And he's like, oh, oh, God, yeah, sorry. And she's like, you forgot, I can't believe you forgot about our anniversary, Simon. I can't believe you forgot about our anniversary again, Simon. I've, I've had it with you. It's like, don't get upset. Don't get... I'll, no, never mind. I'll call them. I'll tell them it's the, the, it's, it's cancelled. I'm going to cancel it. It's like, no, no, that's it, Simon. That's it. I've had it with you now. Right, there's another example of someone getting upset. 
So you can get upset because you're angry. We can get upset because you're sad. Um, let's have a look at Colin's dictionary and see what they say. So it's an adjective. If you're upset, you're unhappy or disappointed because something unpleasant has happened to you. Something bad has happened. For example, after she died, I felt very, very upset. Um, she sounded upset when I said you couldn't give her an appointment. Could you uh, could you give her an appointment? Uh, no. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, just an example. Um, they are terribly upset by the breakup of their parents' marriage. How are the kids handling the uh, the divorce? Oh, they're not handling it very well. They're really upset about it. It's, it's it's not good. Okay, okay. So that's to be upset. Okay, uh, it can be a verb. Something can upset you. You know, like the whole the accident really upset me. So if something upsets you, it makes you feel worried, makes you feel unhappy, or it makes you feel emotional. Okay then. Um, so you know, there's there's more there's more than that. There's more. Um, so you can also upset a situation, you know, like, and that means make the situation sort of go wrong. Uh, for example, if events upset something, like, um, for example, the deal, like a big business deal, like the, um, um, let's see, uh, the, the terrorist attack really upset the, the, the financial markets, for example. House prices in the city are easily upset by other factors. So, for example, you know, Brexit, you know, the referendum, Brexit has upset the, the money markets. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, you can also upset an object. So, if you've got a glass of, I upset a glass of water, that means I spilt the glass of water. Okay. Uh, okay. All right, then. So, there you go. So, anyway, um, I think her name is Liz, but I'm not sure. I think Liz gets really unhappy. She she's sad, and she's she's uh, she says I'm going to get emotional now. And Gordon Ramsay says I don't want you to get upset. From yourself, and I'm sorry, I'm going to get emotional. I don't want you to get upset. I no, am, because I... my husband's been slated to death, and we worked so hard for this business, and it's just killing us all. Like, at this point, Mick has put his arm around his wife and he's trying to comfort her. And Gordon Ramsay's just standing there looking really awkward, like, uh, awkward. So he's he's kind of shocked and he's obviously realising that there's there are lots of issues here. A lot of issues around why this restaurant is failing. And it's, it's it, the issues are that, that Mick, it's his fault. And she's his wife is really upset, but Mick is like unwilling to change. And in fact, he's, he's sort of going, oh, come here, darling. It's all right. It's just really not fair to do that. So I think Gordon Ramsay's a bit shocked by Mick. And it's, a, you know, it's, it's sad, really, that Mick is, it's, 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 it's not good. You know, he's... Um, his actions are, are really not helping his family. It's, it's kind of sad, but he's in denial about it. He's not willing to accept the truth. I would say. And, and I'm not right. denying that you guys work fucking hard. I can see that in your face. Yeah. I can see that from your daughter. Well, I just don't know what to say. And Mick's just like, oh, I, just, I don't know what to say. Okay. I'm going to get some fresh air. And Gordon goes, I'm going to get some fresh air. Okay, then. All right, folks. So you're keeping up with this. So I did write some notes down there as I was reading this. And again, as I said, I'll be putting this stuff up on the page so you can see the words like sci-fi sperm and uh, orange squash and concentrate and a stub the word stubborn and we desperately need help. My husband's been slated to death and it's killing us off. I don't want you to get upset and so on. All right. So let's go on to the next part of the video. And what happens here? This is where things start to get even more problematic. And the, this uh, scene is called family at war. So this is where the family have, have kind of uh, split and uh, they're not getting on with each other at all. So let's listen to Family at War. And this one is three minutes long. So I guess I'm going to play the first minute or so. And then we'll go through it uh, bit by bit. Okay, then. So here we go. What's going on? Can you try and work it out? Can you listen carefully? Try and follow it. Here we are. Before I can start fixing this restaurant, I need to see how bad things really are. So tonight, I'm filling the bistro with 30 locals and I'm going to watch the Martin family in action. 
Have you got peas on? No, so I'm putting them on. That's what I'm saying. Talk to me then, Mick, and I'll know what you want. Mick used to have a burger van, and it shows. He's working on his own and leaving Mo to second guess what he's doing. Mick, is there any chance you could talk a little bit to Mo? It, at least she could help you a bit more if you open up and ask, no? If I say to you five minutes later, she forgets. So what's the I point of like telling her? Fuck two eyes. You do love. Well, whatever, mate. As long as you can make me look small, you're happy. Well, if you was to do all your garnishes and vegetables, I'd know where I am. But I'm doing half of your bloody job as well tonight. It's like a one-man band in there, like he's back in his burger van, cooking in and out of the microwave and totally fucking upside down. I mean, without Mo in the kitchen, he's fucked. We're only an hour and a half into service, but there's already a huge backlog of orders. A mix starting to crumble. I don't want no food sent down until I tell you. OK. No food sent down until he says, OK? Okay. No more food sent down. No more orders. You can't handle it. That's what it is. You can't handle it. Sorry? How long no more orders? I've got to wait until it says if I send one thing down, I'll get my head bit off. I don't. This is ridiculous. If Mick can't cope sending out ready meals, he shouldn't be running a kitchen. Joe, I don't really care what they say. I can only do what I can right. do. I'd rather you didn't take it out you of know. me because I'm just asking. I've had to delay two tables till I half past I've eight. I've got where you're going. Right, I will. I'll stay up there. I like that. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm just writing some things down here. Uh, okay, right, lots of language. Did you manage to work out what was going on there? You could watch the video on the page for the episode. Did I say that? I think I probably did already. Okay, so basically Gordon has said, I need to see the, the family in action. So he's basically he somehow managed to fill the restaurant with 30 people. And uh, he's now in the restaurant observing the way in which they uh, carry out their service um, in the kitchen. And it's pretty ugly, really, because it doesn't work, because Mick can't really handle it. He can't handle the pressure of serving to 30 people, especially when you've got Gordon Ramsay looking over your shoulder. Um, so let's let's go through that stuff again. And there's lots of, lots of language there. Um, here we go. Before I can start fixing this restaurant, I need to see how bad things really are. So Before I can start fixing this restaurant, I need to see how bad things really are, okay? Need to see how bad things really are. So tonight, I'm filling the bistro with 30 locals and I'm gonna watch the Martin family in action. So tonight, I'm filling the bistro with 30 locals and I'm gonna watch the Martin family in action, okay? So tonight, I'm filling the bistro with 30 locals and I'm gonna watch the Martin family in action. Did you hear that that sound? That was the that was the duck being removed from a plastic bag. It's disgusting. Listen for that. 30 locals and I'm going to watch the Martin family in action. Have you got peas on? No, so I'm putting them on. He's going to his wife. His his wife's name's Mo, by the way. You go, "Have you got peas on?" No, so I'm going to put them on. So he's not very nice. Have you got peas on? No, so I'm going to put them on. Meaning, are you cooking peas? No, well, I'm going to do it then. Oh, no, so I'm putting them on. To put peas on means, you know, to start cooking peas. Peas are those little green, little green vegetables. Tiny little green things. When you're a child, you don't want to eat them. Little, little round green things. Peas. You got peas on? No, so I'm putting them on. That's what I'm saying. Talk to me then, Mick, and I'll know what you want. Fucking talk to me then, Nick, and I know what you want. Fucking talk to me. Obviously, he's not communicating with her. He's just getting angry with her because she's not doing the things he wants to do, wants her to do. But he's not even telling her. Fucking talk to me then, Nick. So I know what you want me to do. That's what Fucking I'm saying. talk to me then, Mick, and I know what you want. Mick used to have a burger van, and it shows. Mick used to have a burger van, and it shows. So the, apparently the way that Mick cooks is like the same way he used to cook in his burger van. Just doing it all himself. Working on his own. He's used to working on his own. Mick used to have a burger van and it shows. He's working on his own and leaving Mo to second guess what he's doing. He's leaving Mo to second guess what he's doing. Second guess. I mean, surely you could just say he's leaving Mo to guess what he's doing. But to second guess. Um... Hmm, interesting that one. 
Second guess is a uh, is a phrase. It doesn't mean just guess. It means to guess in advance what someone will do or or what will happen. So it's really second guess is like emphasizing that it's in advance. Okay, second guess someone is sort of predict what someone else is going to do. So she's trying to second guess what he's going to do. She's leaving. He's leaving her to second guess what um, what he's going to do next. Joe's. He's working on his own and leaving Mo to second guess what he's doing. Mick, is there any chance you could talk a little bit to Mo? At least she could help you a bit more if you open up and ask. No. Is there any chance? It's a nice way of making a request, right? Is there any chance you could talk a little bit more? Which is, you know, that's Gordon Ramsay being a bit diplomatic there. Instead of saying, fucking talk more. He's going, is there any chance you could talk a bit more and open up? Open up, you know, if you're not communicating, you're kind of closed, right? If you open up, it means that you talk about what's going on in your head and you reveal things that are going on. Open up. And often open up, we, we mean sort of talk about how you feel as well. So, for example, you know, if, if you're talking to a, uh, uh, a, f- a friend of yours has got a problem, like her dog died or his dog died, right, and he's still really upset about it. And it's like, well, what's the matter with John? It's like, he, he seems really upset. Uh, he's not answering my calls and he just seems all closed off. Is he OK? It's like, I don't know. I think he's really upset about the dog still. I tell you what, I'll go over there tonight. We'll have a cup of tea and let's see if I can talk to him. And then hopefully he will open up and tell us how he's feeling. See if we can try and get him to open up a bit. So to start revealing how he really feels. And guess what he's doing. Mick, is there any chance you could talk a little bit to Mo? At least she could help you a bit more if you open up and ask, no? If you open up and ask. She can help you a bit more if you open up and ask. So uh, Mo can help Mick if he just opens up and asks her to, to help him. All right. I say five minutes later, she forgets. So what's the point of telling her? I tell her and then five minutes later, she forgets, he says. I tell her and then five minutes later, she forgets. So what's the point? All right, it's not very helpful. He's saying that he tells her and five minutes later, she forgets. So what's the point? If I say five minutes later, she forgets. So what's the point I'm of telling like her? fuck too I. And she goes, like fuck do I. Like fuck do I. All right. So if I tell her, then five minutes later, she forgets. Like fuck do I. Which is like saying, no, I don't. Like fuck do I. Like, yeah, I guess the most normal way of saying it would be like, no, I don't. But here is another inventive use of swearing. Like fuck do I. Which just means, I, no, I don't. Right. If I tell her and then five minutes later she forgets, so what's the point? Like fuck do I? I like fuck do I. You do love. Oh whatever, mate. Oh whatever, mate, she says. God, it doesn't seem fun working with Mick. If you can make me look small, you're happy. You know, if and then he goes, If you can make me look small, you're happy. So he thinks that she's just trying to make him look small. If you can make me look small, you're happy. As long as you can make me look small, you're happy. Well, if you was to do all your garnishes and vegetables, I'd know where I am. If you was to do all your garnishes and vegetables, I'd know where I am. If you was to do, like if you did, or if you were to do. If you were to do all your garnishes and vegetables, meaning if you did all your garnishes and vegetables, if you was to do is, you know, technically bad English, isn't it? Um, uh, It should be if you were to do all your garnishes and vegetables. Garnishes are like little side salads that you put on a plate. It's like some lettuce, maybe some carrot and some other bits of salad, a garnish. It's just there to sort of provide a bit of decoration to the plate, but it's edible. That's a garnish, usually made of bits of salad. If you did all your garnishes and vegetables, I'd know where I am. Well, I'm doing half your bloody job as well tonight. It's like a one-man band in there, like he's back in his burger van. It's like a one-man band. A one-man band. Well, I think you know what that is. A band is like a musical group. You know, normally in a band, you have the guitarist, you've got the drummer, you've got the, I don't know, uh, other guitarist, <laughs> you've got the banjo player, um, and uh, you've got the play- the singer. A one-man band is a guy who's got a guitar around his neck. He's also got like a drum on his back and cymbals above his head, and he's got a pedal here, and he's he's also got a mouth organ, and he plays the guitar, the drums, the all the other instruments, and he sings. He's a one-man band. Well, in this case, Mick is is a one-man band as well. It's like a one-man band in there. 
tonight. It's like a one-man band in there, like he's back in his burger van, cooking in and out of the microwave and totally fucking upside down. Totally fucking upside down. If something's upside down, it's the wrong way round, isn't it? Well, you've got ups, upside down, so normally uh, the bottom is at the bottom and the, the top is at the top. But if it's upside down, then it means the top is at the bottom and the bottom is at the top. All right, upside down. Um, you know, for example, if you are if you've got some ketchup in a bottle and you need to get the ketchup out, ketchup doesn't come out of bottles easily. You have to turn it upside down and sort of shake it around a bit, right? Turn it upside down. Wrong way round would mean that the front is at the back. It's wrong way round, okay? And inside out was would be like if you have a T-shirt. And the t-shirt, the design of the t-shirt is on the wrong side, so the label is sticking out. Your t-shirt's inside out, you idiot. Um, you know, or you got it. It's wrong way round, or it's upside down. Upside down. So um, he's saying it's like a one-man band in there. It's like he's back in his burger van, but everything's upside down. It just means that it's all disorganised. You're waving, totally fucking upside down. I mean, without Mo in the kitchen, he's fucked. Without Mo in the kitchen, he's fucked. So another bit of swearing there. And if you're fucked, it means that you are, you're in a really bad situation. You're finished. Yeah. We're only an hour and a half into service, but there's already a huge backlog of orders. We're already an hour and a half into service and there's already a huge backlog a huge backlog of orders, uh, a backlog of orders. So in the restaurant, right, you have orders coming through. The order comes through. You put it up on the on the notice board. You prepare that order. It goes out. Okay. Now the idea is you've got to keep the speed up so that the you you you're cooking the orders quickly enough, and eventually the orders start to start to back up. You end up with more and more orders. And then you get a backlog of orders. That's where there's all these orders that need to be cooked and they're building up and up and up. There's a backlog of orders. So in any other business where you get orders coming in that need to go out and they build up and up and up, you end up with a backlog, a big backlog of orders. It's like, John, yeah, I've got a bit of a problem. Um, look, because Simon is sick and Shirley's not available... We've just got a massive backlog of orders, so I'm going to need you to come in today and and work in the warehouse. All right, so a backlog of, of orders. Um, okay, we've got... Right. But there's already a huge backlog of orders. A mix starting to crumble. Mix starting to crumble. So crumble. I think you know the word crumble, right? I mean, um, crumble means fall apart, collapse. Imagine an old castle an old stone castle that was built in uh, the Middle Ages, like in the in the twelfth century, one of these old castles. And over the centuries, it's got it's got um, it's become older and older, and the the stones are starting to crumble. You know, like bits of the stones are falling off. Um, okay, crumble. Also, if you had a biscuit, if you like, I'm going to take this biscuit to to work with me today, and you put the biscuit in your pocket. And you're going to work and you get on the train and people bump into you and you're like, oh God, the biscuit's going to crumble in my pocket. And you you put your hand in, it's like, oh, time to eat my biscuit when you get to work. And then you realise it's been, it's crumbled, it's it's been crushed in your pocket and it's just crumbled into dust. Oh, what happened to my biscuit? Oh, what's the matter? Oh, it's my biscuit, it's all crumbled. Oh, don't, try not to get too upset. All right. Uh, so uh, Mick is starting to crumble. So he's he's kind of collapsing um, because he can't deal with the pressure. Orders. And Mick's starting to crumble. I don't want no food sent down until I tell you. I don't want no food sent down. I don't want no food. So this is more of Mick's dodgy English. Although, you know, plenty of people speak like that. But I don't want no food. So it's a double negative. He means I don't want any food. I don't want no food sent down. Starting to crumble. I don't want no food sent down until I tell you. Until I tell you. So he's actually closed the kitchen. That the Michelle up uh, in the front of house. She can't send any move, any more orders through. So there is customers now sitting in the restaurant who can't even order food. It's a disaster. I don't want no food. I don't want no food being sent down. Not until I tell you. Okay. No food sent down until he says, okay. 
Okay. No more food sent down. No more. You can't so handle it. That's what it is. You can't. He can't handle it. He can't handle it. To handle it is like to, to, to be able to deal with the, the, the pressure. He just can't handle it. He can't handle the pressure. Handle. H-A-N-D-L-E. He can't handle it. He can't, can't deal with it. He can't take it. He, can't, he just can't handle the pressure. He can't handle it. Okay. No more food sent down. No more orders. You can't, so I'll handle it. That's what it is, you can't handle it. Sorry? How long no more orders? I've got to wait until it says, if I send one thing down, I'll get my head bit off. I don't. If I send one bit of food down, I'll get my head bit off. Again, not quite correct English. I will get my head bit off. What's wrong with that? What's what's? Where's the incorrect uh, part of that? I will get my head bit off. It should be bitten, right? To get your head bitten off. Now, to get your head bitten off is a you know it's a decent phrase, uh, interesting expression. If someone bites your head off, it means they. They get really angry with you and probably shout at you. Like, for example, Mick, um, duck on table for two. I told you no more food, for example. Sorry, neighbours. Sorry, apologising to my neighbours. Like, oh, why is he shouting again? Oh, he's probably doing another podcast. Yes, I do that. Shouting on the podcast. Um, so, what was it? Uh, to get your head bitten off. It's when someone shouts at you. Some angry thing like, I told you no more food, now get out. So, oh God, he bit my head off. Okay, to bite someone's head off. Right, now not literally of course, but just it's an idiom. To bite someone's head off means to shout at someone or be really angry, say some really angry things to someone. You know, like, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to send any more orders down because I'll get my head bitten off. To get your head bitten off. Okay. Um, all right. I daren't. I daren't do it. I dare not do it. I don't dare do it. I daren't do it. I'll get my head bit off or I'll get my head bitten off. I've got to wait until it says, if I send one thing down, I'll get my head bit off. I daren't. This is ridiculous. If Mick can't cope sending out ready meals, he shouldn't be running a kitchen. If Mick can't cope sending out ready meals, he shouldn't be running a kitchen. Okay, now I'm going to let you listen to the second half of this without any interruption. Let's see if you can just follow what's going on, all right? Here we go. Sending out ready meals, he shouldn't be running a kitchen. Joe, I don't really care what they say. I can only do what I can right, do. I'd rather you didn't take it out of me because I'm just asking. I've had to delay two tables till half past eight. I'll go upstairs and where you go on. Right, I will. I'll stay up there. I like that. Thing. Michelle's impressive. She's the one person here who is in control. Sadly, she's now been left to face the fallout from her dad's incompetence. Yeah, I've been waiting a bit hard and half, yeah. It's been too long, to be fair. I've lost count of the minutes and it's just gone yet too long, really. We're hungry. Desperate. <laughs> Those meals Mick did manage to get out of the kitchen are now being sent back. We've got a phone there to communicate. Don't come down here and try and make a scene because you're on camera. Oh, you're the one doing it. it. Can you ask Forget Gordon it. to shut the kitchen down, please? You're gonna I have to. I refuse to work with my husband like this any longer. Right, I'll go and sort it out. I am so sorry, but the beach door is closed. My husband's big fucking dream is a complete farce. Where's he gone? I don't know, Gordon. I don't fucking care. Fucking hell, Mick. Come on. I can't. I'm not gonna fucking have heart attack over this. I don't want you to My have a fucking heart fucking attack. Mad. I don't want you to have a heart attack over this. My heart's fucking booming. I just don't want it. I'm his daughter, and he speaks to me like shit, like mum, you know, and that's his wife. You know, and he thinks he does it because he thinks he gets away with it. He can't get away with it. I can take the knocks. So I think like, I tried to take all the knocks for everybody. But even now I've got a breaking point. Ooh, okay. Even more upsetting there. Um... Okay, I'm just writing some things down. So, yet more language then to deal with. How are you getting on, ladies and gents? Are you following all of this? Or do you need a little bit of help from uh, from the, from the an English teacher, maybe? All right, then, let's, let's see. It says, if I send one thing down, I'll get my head bit off. So, you know, basically what you heard was um, um, it all falling apart and um, the kitchen closes and Mick goes outside to smoke a cigarette um, and basically it's all falling to pieces and, you know, they're all arguing with each other. It's bloody awful. Dent. This is ridiculous. 
If Mick can't cope sending out ready meals, he shouldn't be running a kitchen. He can't cope, he can't handle it, he can't take it, he can't deal with it. Four expressions. He can't cope, uh, can't uh, cope, can't handle it. Um, okay. Can't take it and can't deal with it. All right. Um, if he can't cope... Shouldn't be running a kitchen. Joe, I don't really care what they say. I can only do what I can do. I don't really care what they say. I can only do what I can do. So despite the... the uh, according to Mick, he's doing his best, basically. I can only do what I can do. I care what they say. I can only do what I can do. I'd rather you didn't take it out on me. Know, cause I'm and Michelle's very calm and she says, I'm r I'd rather you didn't take it out on me. I'd rather you didn't take it out on me. If you take it out on someone, it means you express your anger and frustration and you project it on someone else. Don't take it out on me, for example, right? And we've all had that. We've all been in that situation where you're with people and let's say, you know, you're feeling really angry and stressed out. Whatever the situation is, maybe you're driving, you're trying to get somewhere with your family and you're driving and it's stressful and you're trying to find the right exit off the motorway and some, you know, someone else in the family is navigating and you're stressed out and they've made a mistake and you're, and, or you made a mistake and you missed the, the, the turning and like, oh, for Christ's sake, what the f can't you read a map? And the, and you've, you know, the person goes, don't take it out on me. That was, that wasn't my fault. Don't take it out on me. I'm sorry, I'm just feeling really stressed out. I know you are, but don't take it out on me. It's not my fault. To take it out on someone means to sort of put your anger and stress on someone else. So take it out, like um, to, uh, re to release your anger and stress and put it on someone else, to take it out on someone. Okay. Now you could also, you know, it, it could be cathartic, like, you know, why don't you why don't you go down to the gym and take it out on the on the punching bag? So if you've got a lot of anger and stress, you punch the punching bag, you know, like in a boxing gym or something. You punch the punching bag and you take out all your stress and anger on the punching bag. So you don't take it out on your members of your family. You take it out on on the football pitch or something like that instead. Yeah. Take it out on someone. Don't take it out on me. I'd rather you didn't take it out on me because I'm I'd rather you didn't take it out on me. Notice that? I'd rather you didn't. I'd rather you didn't take it out on me. So don't take it out on me. I'd rather you didn't take it out on me. Yes, I'm, I'd rather you didn't. So past tense. Um, I'd rather you didn't take it out on me. Yeah, past tense, even though she's talking about the present. We don't say, I'd rather you don't. No, it's I'd rather you didn't. Mm-hmm. I'd rather you went to... Mm -hmm. I'd rather you didn't. Uh, let's see. I'd rather you go. I'd rather go. I would rather go. Obviously, we know that one, right? I would rather, and then an infinitive form. It's like, what would you rather? Would you rather have tea or coffee? I'd rather have tea, please. Okay. But I'd rather you, if you're talking about uh, criticizing someone's behavior, asking and, and saying that you want them to behave differently, it would be, I'd rather you, and then a uh, past tense. Not to talk about the past, but to talk about the present or the future. All right? It's like a second conditional. I'd rather you didn't talk to me like that. I'd rather you worked a bit harder in the restaurant, please. Okay, I'd rather you didn't, or I'd rather you did something. I'd rather you didn't take it out on me. He shouldn't be running a kitchen. Joe, I don't really care what they say. I can only do what I can I, do. I'd rather you didn't take it out you on know. me, because I'm just asking. I've had to delay two tables till half past I've eight. I've had to delay two tables until half past eight. This is Michelle talking, the daughter. And then Gordon Ramsay is obviously quite impressed by Michelle. She's the only one who seems to have a cool head. You know, Mick is a disaster. He's crumbling. His wife is just, you know, trying to do the best she can. But Michelle is, is you know, she seems to have things under control. Uh, and so Gordon Ramsay says, Michelle's impressive. Michelle's impressive. She's the one person here who is in control. She's the one person here who is in control. Sadly, she's now been left to face the fallout from her dad's incompetence. Sadly, she's now been left to face the fallout of her dad's incompetence. The fallout. This is basically the, 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 the result of a, of a bad thing. 
like you know something happens and then all the bad things happen as a consequence so the consequences or results of a, a bad thing like a mistake for example you know the uk is now experiencing the fallout of brexit you know like since the you know the eu referendum since the uk voted to leave the european union we've experienced a kind of fallout where there's been sort of chaos in parliament and you know uh, the the pound has dropped and you know all these other problems uh, the fallout of the brexit uh, uh, the referendum result um okay and michelle has been left to face the fallout so the fallout of this is the fact that she's now got a restaurant full of unhappy customers who are waiting and waiting and waiting, and she's left to face the fallout. So she's got to actually, uh, you know, deal with this situation. And she goes around the restaurant, and we we can hear customers uh, talking about how they're not happy and how they're having to wait for a long time. Who is in control? Sadly, she's now been left to face the fallout from her dad's incompetence. The fallout from her dad's incompetence. Incompetence is like you know. Uh, your your uh, errors or the fact that you can't do things properly, incompetence. If you're competent, it means you can do things well. If you're incompetent, it means you get everything wrong. Um, From her dad's incompetence. Yeah, I've been waiting about an hour and a half, yeah. I've been waiting about an hour and a half, yeah. Now, this is in Devon, right? So they do speak with a slight sort of Devon accent. I've been waiting about an hour and a half, yeah. I've been waiting. I've been waiting. Yeah, I've been waiting an hour and a half, yeah. Too long, to be fair. I've lost count of the minutes. And... Too long, to be fair. I've lost count of the minutes. So they're all unhappy because they're having to wait a long time. Too long, to be fair. I've lost count of the minutes. and it's just long, Too long, really. We're hungry. Desperate. We're hungry. Desperate. So all the, all the customers are desperately hungry. Those meals Mick did manage to get out of the kitchen are now being sent back. Check out the passive uh, voice in that one. Those meals that did, those meals that Mick did manage to get sent out of the kitchen, are now being sent back. The food is being sent back now, which means the customers are sending it back to the to the kitchen because it's not cooked properly or it doesn't taste good or something. Are being sent back. Oh, really? We're hungry, desperate. <laughs> Those meals Mick did manage to get out of the kitchen are now being sent back. We've got a phone there to communicate. Don't come down here and try and make a scene because you're on camera. Don't come down here and try and make a scene. If you make a scene, it means you cause like a big problem. And it's like, you know, um, obviously a big problem. For example, a big argument and there's lots of noise. And all the other people are like, oh, what's that? What's going on? Are they having an argument? Oh, look at this. You know, um, to make a scene. Imagine you're in a public place and, um, for example, um, you're a customer in a restaurant and someone sent you some food and it's not good enough and you make a big scene. Like you loudly complain about it. You throw your throw down your napkin and you walk out and you make a big scene. And everyone's like, oh my God, what's going on there? Oh, they're not happy, are they? Who are they? Do you know them? Oh, yeah, they're, I think they live on our street. It's like, don't make a big scene, darling. Don't make a big scene. Don't make a fuss. And so uh, here, Mick is saying, don't come down here and make a scene because you're on camera. So he's saying to Michelle, don't come down here and, you know, argue with me and make a big scene uh, because you're on camera. So he's, you know, embarrassed. There to communicate. Don't come down here and try and make a scene because you're on camera. Oh, you're the one doing it. Can you ask for them to shut the kitchen down, please? You're going to have to. I refuse to work with my husband like this any longer. I refuse to work with my husband like this any longer. Right, I'll go and sort it out. And Michelle goes, I'll go and sort it out. So if you sort something out, it means you fix the problem. I'll go and sort it out. Nice phrasal verb, that one, isn't it? I'll go and sort it out, mean I'll go and fix it. All right, I'll go and sort it out. Michelle looks like she's got her head screwed on. Right, I'll go and sort it out. I'll go and sort it out. I'm so sorry, but the bistro is closed. The bistro is closed now, apparently. And now we see Mick outside. He's lighting a cigarette. He's standing outside the restaurant because he can't handle it. And apparently he's suffering. He's like having major stress here. He's talk he talks to Gordon about how his heart is booming. Boom, boom, boom. His heart's booming like that. And he's like, I can't handle it. I don't want to have a heart attack. 
which is ironic considering he's smoking a cigarette. I'll tell you what, mate, I've, my heart's booming. I don't want to have a heart attack about this. Like, maybe it's best to stop smoking then, Mick. My husband's big fucking dream is a complete farce. My husband's big fucking dream is a complete farce. A farce is like a ridiculous comedy of errors, like a kind of play, a play in the theatre, a play where everything goes wrong and it's totally ridiculous, a farce. My husband's great fucking dream is a big fucking farce. Did she say fucking farce? I don't She might as well have done. Big farce. Where's he gone? I don't know, Gordon. I don't fucking care. He's gone outside. Yeah, Come on. I can't, I'm not going to fucking have a heart attack over this. I'm not going to have a fucking heart attack over this. I'm not going to have a heart attack over this. No, you're not going to have a heart attack over this, but you will have a heart attack because of the smoking, Mick. I'm not going to have a fucking heart attack over this, he says, while smoking a cigarette. Clever. Heart attack over this. I don't want you to My have a fucking, fucking heart attack. Nuts. I don't want you to have a heart attack over this. My heart's fucking booming, I just don't want it. I'm his daughter and he speaks to me like shit, like mum, you know? I'm his daughter and he speaks to me like shit. To speak to someone like shit or to treat someone like shit. Here's another bit of, let's let's say, inventive swearing, right? Here's another phrase with, with involving a swear word. To treat someone like shit or to speak to someone like shit. To, that means to treat someone badly or speak to someone badly. I'm his daughter and he speaks to me like shit. It's his wife. You know, and he thinks he does it because he thinks he gets away with it. He can't get away with it. He does it because he thinks he can get away with it. Another phrasal verb, to get away with it. That means you do something wrong and you don't get punished. For example, to get away with it, you know, like I, f I, I found this bag of money in the street, right? I think it belonged to this gangster who, he was dead, right? I didn't do it, but I took the money, but it's all right because I think I got away with it. And then, dun, 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 police. Oh, God, we didn't get away with it. That's the police, for example, all right, to get away with it. He, he, he speaks to me like shit, and he speaks to my mum like shit, and he does it because he thinks he can get away with it, but he can't get away with it. He gets away with it. He can't get away with it. I can take the knocks. So I think, like, I try to take all the knocks for everybody. I try and take the knocks for everybody. This is Mo, and she's crying. She's saying, I try to take the knocks. So a knock is a bit like a hit, you know, like a, like a, a like a, like if you get hit, that's a knock. Uh, I try to take the knocks. The knocks means like the bad things that happen to you, like the the failures or the, just the bad stuff that happens. And maybe it's the moments when Mick gets angry and says something, you know. Uh, Mo is the one who takes the knocks. She's the one who takes the impact of of the problems. So, you know, Mo is there trying to, you know, protect other members of her family. She's trying to protect Mick and she's trying to protect Michelle. Um, and she's the one who takes the knocks. And, you know, it's not fair on her, is it? And she's upset. It's all the knocks for everybody. I try to take Shit all the... Shit like mum, you know? I try to take all the knocks for everybody. His wife, you know, and he thinks he does it because he thinks he gets away with it. He can't get away with it. I can take the knocks. So I think, like, I try to take all the knocks for everybody. Uh, even I've got a breaking point. Even I've got a breaking point. So a breaking point is the point at which you break. Even I've got a breaking point. So it sounds terrible. It's like breaking point for this family. Um, now we're 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 fast running out of time here, uh, but we're not all the way through this story. But I think I'm not going to do a part three of this. But I will just basically tell you how it worked out in the end. So so um, essentially. Um, but, you know, Gordon tried to uh, work on, on Mick and try to make him like face up to the problems that he had, like the financial problems, the issues with the food um, and so on, and, and the issues with his communication with his family. He tried to, uh, Im you know, improve all those things with Mick, but Mick was so stubborn and maybe in denial, meaning not willing to accept um, uh, the reality of the situation, for whatever reason, Mick just wasn't in a position to to turn things around. And so in the end, um, Gordon decided that he would change things. And he, he put Mick in the front of house, meaning Mick was uh, out in the restaurant serving at tables and, and greeting customers. And Michelle was in the kitchen because he thought Michelle's the only one who's got her head screwed on. 
She's got her head screwed on, you know. Uh, so let's put her in the kitchen. And he also arranged for Michelle to have a little bit of formal training in another kitchen where she learned some, some, some techniques. She'd never cooked in the kitchen before, but he put her in at the deep end, right in the kitchen, and she did a much better job than Mick did. And it worked out for a while. But Mick was still the problem because, um, you know, Mick was like lazy and all this kind of thing. So the problems continued and it, and it, and it was really a family issue. Um, and um, so they did start making... Uh, the, after putting Michelle in the kitchen and after she kind of rose to the challenge, um, the, they reopened the place with new design. So they repainted it and got rid of the psychedelic wallpaper, uh, a new uh, a menu with fresh food, and it was a success. It was a success. It worked. And uh, the customers were much more happy. Everything seemed to work. Even though there were still some problems with Mick and his approach, generally speaking, it worked. And there is a there is another a final scene here where uh, Gordon catches up. Gordon catches up with uh, the family a few months later to see what was going on. And um, I guess we can just listen to all of this, can we? I'm not going to uh, like go through it all bit by bit. Um, I tell you what, you know what? I don't have time. I'm not going to play that to you now. But you can find that video on the uh, on the page for this episode, as as usual, and it'll just show you what happened a few months later, and it just shows that things are basically you know a lot better essentially, uh, and um, and that the uh, with the new arrangement with Michelle in the kitchen that kind of solved a lot of the problems, and I think Mick also turned things around a bit and uh, improved um, improved his attitude and, and, and so on. So despite the fact that we, we listened to a lot of uh, the family having problems and arguing and it all breaking down and, and the, the tears and the, uh, the arguments and stuff, I think in the end it worked out okay after they, they managed to solve their problems. But, you know, that's often the way, isn't it, when you're sort of running a business or something that, um, you know, there are often personal issues that cause the business to go wrong and if you're brave enough to face up to the those issues, you can deal with them and move on and make it all more successful. And um, they changed the name of the restaurant. They they changed it Martin's Bistro, not uh, um, not the Dovecote Bistro, and it was more personalised and generally good. So check it out. Check out the video on the page for the episode on the page for this episode, and you'll see. There's also I found the whole episode. The entire episode, which is about an hour, um, the whole thing, I found it on YouTube with Korean subtitles. So if you're from Korea and you want to see that with Korean subtitles so you understand all of it, then you can find that video on the page as well. And if you're not Korean, if you just want to see the whole episode with all the other bits that you missed, you can find it on the page for this episode too because I'm nice like that. Okay, thanks very much for listening to this episode of the podcast. Ooh... That was about, what, an, two hours and 20 minutes in total of Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares. Um, but I certainly hope that you've picked up a lot more language from that uh, and that, um, you know, that you in, sort of enjoyed listening to, uh, you know, this family struggling to make their restaurant business uh, successful and that you enjoyed listening to Gordon Ramsay and his straight talking approach. Um, all right. I think that's the end of this episode. Don't forget, as always, to um, subscribe to the mailing list uh, in the top right hand corner of every page on the website there's a little form where you can just put your email address and then every time i upload a new episode of this podcast uh, you'll get an email in your inbox and you can click the link in the email and it'll take you straight to the page where you'll find everything you need uh, all of the episodes of luke's english podcast are available in the archive just check out the archive on the website um, and i understand that recently people have noticed that on itunes not every episode is available on iTunes because, as far as I know, iTunes has a limit of 400 episodes. It's got a 400 episode limit, iTunes. So when I start uploading more than 400, the, the old episodes start to disappear. Okay, so if you check out my podcast on iTunes, you'll see that the first 25 episodes are missing. And now they still exist. You can still get those episodes you can still get them on my website. They're still there in my RSS feed. So even though they're missing from iTunes, they're still available. So if you want to get those early episodes, you can find them all on the website. You can download the MP3s. Uh, most of those episodes have transcripts as well. So you can still check them out. And you can see what Luke's English Podcast was like 
nearly eight years ago. It's about eight years ago that I started doing this podcast. Um, and if you've been listening from the very beginning, then hello, nice one. Welcome for welcome. Welcome. I think a welcome is long overdue if it's been eight years. But anyway, hello to those of you who've been listening from the very beginning. If you're a new listener, then hello to you too. And I hope that you enjoy exploring the episode archive and seeing all the stuff that I've done in the past on this podcast. And if you're just uh, you know, a midterm listener, then you know, hello to you as well. All right, then. Okay, so I look forward to reading comments and things. Uh, let me know what you think about Gordon Ramsay and what you think of the show. Do you have a similar show in your country? What's the restaurant culture like where you are? You know, just get involved in the conversation on the website. There's lots of very friendly people conversing with each other there now. It's really nice. Okay, that's enough for this episode. Thanks very much for listening. Speak to you again on the podcast very, very, very soon. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. Bye, 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 bye. Okay, that's the end of the audio. The video is still rolling. Thanks very much for what. <laughs> Thanks very much for watching. Uh, it's boiling hot in here now, which is strange because it's been very cold recently. But because I've got the sun shining right in my face, it's quite warm in here. And I've just been podcasting for about two two and a half hours, so I'm a little tired. But that's the end of the video. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. You know, leave me a comment or something. Let me know what you think of the videos and how they're going. Um, just let me know. All right. But thanks for watching. And I'll, I'll speak to you again soon as well. All right, then. Cheers. Bye.